Bible Baptist Church. There's something very, very special about being in ministry. Along the way, you meet some people that God has uniquely chosen to do certain things for his cause. And uh, we crossed paths with the Williford family back in uh, 2011, just a couple of years ago. And uh, they blessed our church family coming to our missions conference. We were the third church for them to come to after their approval uh, to go to the field of the Philippines. We're talking about some career people that were in a great church in, uh, in Texas, Hallmark Baptist Church, serving the Lord there, and then God just touched their hearts through a missions conference. And uh, they prepared themselves, their family. Of course, we have with us today Sean and Janelle and Ashton and Aaron. Uh, their daughter and son, and they are preparing to go. Matter of fact, three weeks from tomorrow, they will fly out, fly out of the United States for their tour of duty in the Philippines. When I heard about that they are coming to the end of their, their deputation is what we call it. They go from churches to churches seeking support, and the Lord's leading in those churches. They've been in about 90 churches, and 50 churches have taken them on for support, ours being one of them. That's just how it works among our kinds of churches. They have enjoyed being able to, well, I don't know if the word is enjoy. You have. Yeah, the Lord's prepared you. Going to the churches, meeting pastors that are just exactly like me. Churches that are just exactly like ours. No, they have met all flavors of ice cream. And uh, they kind of like our ice cream. They like being here. And so, did you know, they came here. We were the third church they were in. Now we're the third church before they leave the United States. And so they're here today. And I, Brother Sean, I heard that, it, that I invited him to come. I said, I want you to come. You guys are just so special to us. And I said, I'm going to yield my preaching time to you. And we want to hear from you what God's word. I mean, after two years, there's something in this guy that's burning. And uh, it was before. And he's going to share with us God's word to us today. And uh, he had a sign. I saw a sign he was holding. said, we'll preach for love offering. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, you'll go. He's needing... And so at the end of the service today, we want to receive a special offering for the Willifords as they now go to the field of the Philippines. And uh, I, I, I'm just excited about what God's going to do in their life. Brother Sean, why don't you come at this time? Give him a hand. What a blessing. Brother Sean. Thank, Thank you. Bless you, brother. Thank you very much. Lord bless you. Well, it's a blessing to be here. I tell you, I enjoy hanging out with your pastor. There is never... A dull moment around Kim Hayes. And I never know what he's going to say, so I'm glad that went as it did. Uh, maybe not in any other direction. I know we were here quite a while ago, and I know there are many of you who probably don't know Sean and Janelle Williford. We were in your missions conference in August of 2011, and it was just before that we met your former uh, worship pastor, Dave Brinkman. I know this guy looks and sounds a lot like him, but he didn't look like he did when we were here a couple years ago. So I'm glad you have a new worship pastor and looks and sounds a lot like Dave Brinkman. But no, we, Dave and I met actually before that missions conference, talked about some life group things down in Duncan, Oklahoma, where I have some family. And then we were invited to come to your missions conference, and we have, we have fallen in love with this church. Um, your pastor means a great deal to us. You all mean a great deal to us. I know we're friends with some of you on Facebook, and follow us, and we get notes from you from time to time. And I'll tell you, that, that does a missionary a lot of good. When we're on the road and traveling, I know Brian and uh, Rebecca Ryder are out on the road right now, and sometimes that road gets a little long. Send them a note. Just say, hey, we're thinking about you. We're praying for you. That can really lift up a missionary during that time. But we came here in 2011 and have spent the last two years on the road. We do leave in three weeks for Metro Manila. We have secured a home where we'll be living, and uh, assuming our container gets there, in a decent amount of time. We ship that next Friday, and it should be there by mid-August. 
Um, so hopefully we'll, after two years, be able to establish a home again, which Janelle is looking forward to very, very much. We came to Fort Worth, Texas in 2005. I had a career as an athletic trainer or working in sports medicine, and that career brought me to Fort Worth, Texas. I was a professor of uh, athletic training and sports medicine, ran the education program at Texas Christian University, began attending Hallmark Baptist Church fairly soon after we moved to Fort Worth. And it was there that God really got a hold of our hearts. We had always talked about missions or doing something, but it was August of 2008, August 3rd, 2008 to be exact, and you may know the name of Clifford Clark. But Clifford Clark came to speak at Hallmark Baptist Church, and as he talked that night about the work going on around the world, as churches like Bible Baptist Church faithfully give to missions, God was getting a hold of my heart that it was time for us to start to do something different and use the talents that he had given us for his kingdom rather than building our earthly kingdom here. And it was then that we made a decision to go into ministry. We spent the next couple of years finishing up things at TCU, trying to leave in a very ethical way, and then beginning our internship at Hallmark Baptist Church in 2010. We were approved as Baptist Bible Fellowship missionaries in 2011, and then hit the road to raise our support. Um, it has been a blessing. It, if you have to make it what it is, and it's a lot of miles. We've done about 60 to 70,000 miles, been in 34 states from east coast to west coast, north to south um, over the last two years, but it also has given our kids a great opportunity to see our country, to see many things that many kids or many, many adults don't get a chance to see, and we have tried to take advantage of those along the way. But I think this morning I just want to say thank you to a very faithful church who has supported us for two years already, waiting for us to get to this point of going to the field. Not once has a check ever missed from Bible Baptist Church, and that's a blessing to a missionary to know every month that I'm going to see the amount, $100 from Bible Baptist Church, come into our account and know that I can count on that. And I appreciate that very much from the bottom of our heart. We also appreciate the prayers. Many people this morning have already said we're praying for you. Uh, we think of you often and we pray for you. And I want to say thank you. Um, we may have said this when we were here before. We may not have. But we were told early on that prayer or uh, money will get you there, but prayer will keep you there. And to be honest with you, we appreciate your financial support every month, and we can't do it without that. But we covet your prayers. And so I'd ask you to continue to pray for our family. And we know the, tra the transition will not be easy all the time. We know there will be roadblocks, and we know there's no other place that Satan would rather us not be than in the Philippines. And he'll do whatever he can to keep us from being effective there. And so I'd ask for your prayers over our family. As we make that transition, we begin to learn the language and begin to minister and work alongside the Filipino people. This morning I want to talk to you about giving to missions. This church is known for your heart. A lot of that heart comes from your pastor. Um, I just have to brag on your pastor for a minute. We tell people all around the country, there is no pastor, I think, in my experience, who is as evangelistic as your pastor. I wish I had that talent. I wish I could speak to the people about the Lord. And I'm a missionary. That's what I'm supposed to do. I wish I had the talent, the gifts that your pastor has. Um, many of you are probably sitting in this room today because he led you to the Lord personally. Um, I can't wait to sit in a restaurant with him and see whether or not that waitress is going to come to the Lord or not. Um, see, you all know what I'm talking about. But you follow your pastor's heart, and you are a very giving church, and you're a very loving church. But this morning I want to talk to you about some principles for missions giving, and our main text will be 2 Corinthians 8. But before we get there, if we're going to talk about principles for missions giving to missions, I think we first have to ask, answer the question, why should we care? Why should we care about missions? When we talk about worldwide missions, why should you sitting here in Chickasha, Oklahoma, care about what's going on in Manila, Philippines today? We have some friends that just moved to a restricted access nation. Why should you care about where they are? They've been in your missions conference. Why should you care what's going on in Africa? Why should you care what's going on in Europe with the gospel? Wales, where the rights are going. Why should you even care? Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We know that passage of Scripture as the Great Commission if you were to turn to Mark 16, 15 and read that passage, you would see similar content. Luke 24, 45 through 48, you'd see the Great Commission again. In John 20 and 21, and if you turn to Acts 1, 6 through 9, the parting words of our Savior, 
the same commission for us to go into all the world and spread the gospel. Now, if I read my Bible and Jesus Christ says something to me, God the Father says something to me once, I'm supposed to obey that. That's a command that He's been given to me. If I read my Bible and Jesus has said it five times, we better pay attention. You see, we should care about missions because Jesus cares about missions. We should care about missions because it's God's heart. And so if we sit here today in Chickasha, Oklahoma, and we call ourselves Christians, we are followers of Jesus Christ, then we better care about missions. There is no plan B. God doesn't have another plan for the gospel to get to the Philippines, for the gospel to get to China, to Europe, to Africa. We, His people, are that plan. And as independent Baptists, we partner missionary and church to take the gospel around the world. And so every person sitting in here today better care about missions. I heard this quote by Spurgeon. He said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. It's not the missionary's job to spread the gospel. It's not the pastor's job to spread the gospel. I didn't get a new Bible. When I got approved in May 2011, they didn't say, here's your missionary Bible, and it includes Matthew 28, 18 through 20. No, that was in my Bible before I became a missionary. It is every Christian's responsibility to spread the gospel. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. In verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, we do you wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how then in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I ask for your blessing on this time. Lord, I ask that you would empty me out and that the words I speak would be yours and yours alone. I pray that you would speak to the heart of every Christian in this room. Lord, if there's a non-believer, I pray that you would prick their heart with the gospel message. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to spread your gospel. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be involved in what you're doing around this world through our finances, through our prayer, but most importantly, through our testimony and our going. We ask your blessing upon this time. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we look at our giving principles, the first principle is that we must first give ourselves to the Lord. If you turn with me back into verse 5, it says, And this they did. He's speaking to, about the church in Macedonia to the Corinthians. Paul is going around and collecting money to take back to Jerusalem to the saints because they've fallen on a time of need and they need a little help. And so there are churches in Paul's area that he is going and he's collecting money to take back to the saints. And it says, talking of the Macedonians, and this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. You cannot, you cannot give to missions without first giving yourself to the Lord. You cannot fully give yourself to a missionary in prayer, whatever the case may be, without first giving yourself to God. The relationship between the church and the missionary is vital. In the way we do missions as independent Baptists, it is vital that we have this relationship with you to do missions around the world. However, it pales in comparison to the relationship that each Christian sitting in a pew today at Bible Baptist Church in Chickasha, Oklahoma, has with God the Father. Your relationship with God the Father, with our Son, Jesus Christ, is way more important than the missionary church relationship. Why? Because that relationship must come first. Because our generosity stems from our devotion to Jesus Christ. You see, as we empty ourselves, as we give ourselves to Jesus Christ, and we empty ourselves, and the Holy Spirit fills us up, then and only then can you be generous as God wants you to be. Then and only then will you care about what's going on around the world, and missions the way God cares. Because you see, if we don't empty ourselves, if we don't turn our lives over to God, we will not care like God cares. It's simple. As a human being, I stand here before you and I tell you that without Jesus Christ, I wouldn't care probably. But 
as I empty myself out and I start to understand Jesus Christ better and I want to be more like Jesus and I want to have the heart of Jesus, I can't help but be burdened for the people in the Philippines. I can't help but be burdened for the people in Europe and in Africa. I simply go where God calls us to go. I'll be honest with you, if you remember our testimony, we did not want to go to the Philippines. That was the last place that I said we wanted to go. I said, God, deputation will take too long. And I stand here with the average being 32 to 34 months, giving God the glory that after 24 months, we're leaving. That is God's plan, not mine. That is God's doing, not ours. If we are to completely give ourselves to God's mission, we must give ourselves first to God. We have to understand also that our giving ourselves to God is not conditional. The Macedonians, not everything was perfect. They weren't sitting in a time of luxury and everything was great. No. A lot of times in America right now we say, well, our, our mission's giving us down or I can't give because the economy's poor. The Macedonians had been pilfered by the Roman government. They had taken everything. They would kind of oppressed them. But yet we see the Macedonians first giving themselves to God and then begging Paul to be a part of an offering that he's taking up for the saints in Jerusalem. Begging him to be a part of that. I stand in the same group, but how many of us today would sit here and say, I beg to be a part of an offering? Grace didn't remove the trials from the Macedonians. What grace did was allow them to give as they desired, despite their condition and their circumstances. Our generous giving will always follow our personal dedication. Somebody that has given themselves to God, and I think we would recognize from our times, is a gentleman by the name of Billy Graham. Billy Graham had returned home from a crusade and he came out of the airport and there waiting for him was a limo, as there often was. And he went to get in the limo and he thought, you know, this time I think I'd like to do something a little different. There was a young chauffeur. He said, you know, I've always ridden in the back. I'd really like to drive tonight. And the young chauffeur said, by all means, you're Mr. Billy Graham. You go ahead and do whatever you want. So the chauffeur went around. He got in the passenger side. Billy Graham jumped in the driver's seat and they headed down the highway. And he started to get the hang of it, so he laid on it a little bit. And he was doing about 75 through a 65. Well, there was a rookie state trooper that was sitting there on the side of the highway. And he goes, oh yeah, I got this one. He pulls out behind this limo and he pulls him over. And the rookie state trooper comes up to the limo and the window goes down and he sees Mr. Billy Graham and he says, I'll be right back. And he goes back to his squad car and he gets on the phone with his supervisor and he says, hey, I know we are sticklers for the law. And I know that we also at times give some people a little break. Very important people. And I've pulled over somebody very important tonight. He said, well, who have you pulled over, the governor? He said, oh, no, no, no. It's way more important than that. He said, well, who have you pulled over, the president of the United States? Oh, no, no, this person's much more important than that. He said, well, who have you pulled over? He says, well, I think I've pulled over Jesus Christ because he has Billy Graham as his chauffeur. <laughs> but all kidding aside, all kidding aside, if that rookie state trooper came up to the limo and rolled down the window and you were sitting there, what do you think you have Jesus Christ in the back? We must first give ourselves to missions. God doesn't want your money. The truth is, is that God doesn't need me to go to the Philippines to spread the gospel. God wants our heart. When God gets our heart and he gets all of us and we give ourselves completely to Jesus Christ, everything else will fall in line. God wants you. Before you can understand how to give a missions, you must first give to God. The second principle for giving to missions is that we are to give faithfully. We must give faithfully. And this church, I just told you, is a very faithful church. But how are you doing, Christian? You're a member of this church. How are you personally doing? Not how is the church doing, but how are you doing? The Corinthians had a strong desire. As we look at the next part of this scripture, they had a passion and a desire to give to that offering to the saints in Jerusalem. They did. As we start to look... But remember, they had promised and they had desired to give just like maybe you did back in August. You had a Faith Promise Missions Conference as we attended two years ago. You made a promise during that time to give to your missions program. Let me remind you that that promise was not to me as a missionary. That promise is not to your pastor. That promise is to God to be a part of His program. Remember that promise that you made as we look in verse 6, continuing on, insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would finish it in you, the same grace also. That word finish it means to bring to successful completion. You may have had a desire and you promised to do something. Now let's finish. 
Let's completely, successfully finish that desire that we had or that promise that we'd made. He said, so He would finish in you the same grace also. Well, what grace is that? As we look in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. It was only by the grace of God the Macedonians in their situation were able to be generous. And so as he's talking to the church in Corinth, he's now saying, ask for that same grace. We sent Titus so that you may have that same grace of generosity as well. Verse 7, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us. He's telling them all these things are great. You have a desire to have knowledge. You have a desire to have speech. You desire to have faith and you have all those things. You are doing so well. But then he goes on and he says, see that ye abound in this grace also. Add to those things that you desire and that you're doing so well, add to that the grace of generosity. In verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion on the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. I speak not by commandment, but on occasion of forwardness of others. He's saying, look at the Macedonian example. How they give to the church. And I don't command you to do what they do. I'm not commanding you, as he'll write in 2 Corinthians 9-7, that God loveth a cheerful giver. He wants him, them to empty themselves out like the Macedonians, fill themselves up with God, and have the generosity and to give as the Macedonians are giving. In verse 9, he gives them the example, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He's basically saying, remember that guy that died on the cross for you? Remember that man who left heaven? Left the throne room of God knowing that while you were still a sinner, he came down, experienced the pain and the shame of this earth, freely stretched out his hands on a cross, and they didn't take his life. He gave it for you and I. As he laid down a cross on a cross for you, Corinthian, don't you think you could sacrifice a little? Don't you think you could follow through with the commitment that you'd made? Verse 10, and here, and I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have gone before. Not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. He's saying that a year ago you shared a desire. Now therefore, in 11, this is the only time that he gives them an imperative. He says, now therefore, perform the doing of it. He said, you promised to do something, now finish it. You promised to do something, now do what you had promised to do. It says, that as, that as there was a readiness to will, so... <clears throat> lost my place. Now therefore perform doing it. That as there was a readiness to will, so there may also be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. You know, we must first give ourselves to God, but we are to give faithfully. And the third principle is that we are to give by faith or sacrificially. The Greek word for faith, pistis, is, means to believe to the extent or complete trust and reliance. My favorite verse, 11.1. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I heard it said in layman's terms that faith is doing in advance would only make sense in reverse. Faith is doing in advance would only make sense in reverse. As you committed to your faith promise missions giving, was it by faith? Did it not make sense at the time? I would encourage you that if you gave and it totally made sense, then maybe it wasn't by faith. I'll be honest, we gave to Faith Promise Missions for a long time before we ever gave by faith. There's a difference between giving faithfully and giving by faith. As we finish up those verses, for I mean, in verse 13, not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by inequality, that now at this time of your abundance may be a supply for their want, and that their abundance may also be a supply for your want, and there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. He's simply saying, you have an abundance. Like the Macedonians in verses 1 through 5, would you have that desire and the generosity to give above and beyond and to sacrifice a little so that all may have some? I want to try and illustrate that for you this morning. If you would turn with me to the book of John, verse 6. I'm sorry, chapter 6. The book of John, chapter 6, will start in verse 4. And in verse 4 it says, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. 
Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. You know this story as the feeding of the 5,000, as it tells us in verse 10 of this chapter that there were 5,000 men seated on the hillside. And we often give Philip at this point a very hard time. and say, Philip, you're with Jesus, dude. Just get with the program. But as you stand with Philip next to Jesus, think about it for a moment. He's looking out at this hillside of 5,000 men. That's how they numbered households at the time. Next to every man was a woman. And if as a household, most likely they had children, and we'll just go, we have two children, so I like that number. Let's just go with two children in every household. And now Philip is standing next to Jesus looking at 20,000 people on a hillside. And he looks into his money bag and says, I've got 200 days wages. Jesus, we can't do this. Very practical. Jesus, we can't do this. And the fact is, is that Jesus wasn't standing next to Philip saying, hey, I need you to run down to Walmart and buy some bread for all these people. That is not what Jesus was saying. The Bible tells us he said he knew what he would do. He said this to test him. Essentially, he was standing next to Philip and saying, hey, I'm about to do something really cool on the hillside today. You want to be a part of that or not? And he gives us the same opportunity today. He sits here today and says, we are doing something great around the world. Jesus is going to spread the gospel around the world. We know the end, that all the nations will hear. Every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, right? We know that that's the end. Jesus is about to do something really cool in the world. Do you want to be a part of that or not? I heard the statement about commitment. It said when in regards to commitment, you're either in or you're out. In regards to God's program to spread the gospel around the world for missions, you're either in or you're out. As we continue on in verse 8, it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, who we never give a hard time to. Simon Peter's brother saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. I love reading this out of John for the simple fact that it's the only gospel that tells us who brought the bread. There is no other gospel that tells us that a little boy was the man who brought it, or the, the individual that brought the bread. There are two disciples there who doubt. Andrew doubted. I imagine that there was a little boy and he had a satchel and he brought it over to Andrew and he said, I would like to give. I I see that maybe you're looking for food and I would like to give what I have. And Andrew said, well, what you got? And so the little boy opened up his satchel and he started to break stuff out and he said, well, I've got some loaves of bread. I've got, the family, we have five loaves of bread. And then he looked further down into his satchel and he had a couple fish. I think they were more edible than these, but I believe Jesus Christ could do something with these. But this is all the boy brought was five loaves and two fish. And what was Andrew? Andrew said, well, that's so exciting. Come on over. Jesus, look what the boy brought. That's not what Andrew did. I think he brought the little boy over to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I know you're busy, but this little boy's got five loaves and two fish that he wants to give you. But really, you see the 20,000 people. What is that among so many people? We can't do anything with it. On the hillside that day, it was a little boy that had faith. That little boy looked into his satchel, and I believe, the text doesn't tell us, but I believe that if that boy were to turn his satchel over, there would be nothing left. I think that little boy brought everything that day for the cause of Jesus Christ. And brought everything to Jesus and said, I don't know, this isn't much, but you do with it what you want to. Jesus, I know my five dollars isn't much, but would you take it and do what you can for worldwide missions? $20 a week doesn't seem like a lot. $100 a month doesn't seem like a lot. But see, when we give to missions, it's like this miracle that happened on the hillside. In verse 11, the whole story changes. In verse 11, it says, and Jesus took the loaves. You're right, that $20 in your pocket that you give to missions would do nothing on your account. Until, like that little boy, you give it to Jesus. And Jesus took the loaves And he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and then the disciples, those that had seated on the side of the hill. And it fed them so that they all just had a little bit, and they were satisfied. No. It fed them as much as they would. Not only did it feed them as much as they would, but when he got done, they went around and they collected 12 basketfuls. Let me suggest to you that regardless of what you give, God doesn't care about the mount. He cares about your heart. As you give to missions, there will be an abundance, and your dollar, every penny of it, will go to further the kingdom of God. And that will be blessed to your account. We just simply need to get involved. 
that little boy got involved that day on the side of the hill as we continue on. And when Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed his disciples and disciples to them that were sat down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had eaten. Let me suggest to you for a moment that this child was like the Macedonians. That this child didn't give out of his abundance, out of his family's abundance. I'm going to suggest to you this morning, even though the text doesn't clearly say it, that this boy was poor. And this is where I get that. As it comes, and it says that the boy brought five loaves of bread and two fish, it says he brought five barley loaves. Barley was a grain of the poor. Wheat was a grain of the rich. If this boy was truly rich, he would have had wheat loaves. But the problem in the text comes is that he brought two fish to, the, to Andrew. And fish and meat were something that, of a luxury item that the rich had. Except certain times of the year. There were certain times of the year that the poor would have fish and would have meat. And those were times of festivals. Look at with me in verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. I believe that little boy and his family had meat, or had the fish, because it was a special time of year, not because he was rich. Yet he brought everything to God. He brought everything to Jesus and laid it at his feet and said, you use it however you want to. I pour it all out for you. And I can't help but think that there are 19,999 other people sitting on the hillside that day looking at this little boy bring his lunch to Jesus and they get fed. And I can't help but think that out of 19,999 other people, somebody else didn't have food. I've got to think somebody else had food. They just chose to sit on the hillside and not play the game. They chose to sit on the hillside and not get involved and not bring what they had to Jesus. Jesus used what that little boy of faith had to feed the people on the hillside that day. In order to effectively give to missions, which is the heart of God, we must first give ourselves to God and we are to give faithfully and we should give sacrificially by faith. I close with this. David Platt and his radical together during the, in the um, introduction writes, High atop the Andes Mountains, the rays of the sun strike and a single drop of water forms. It begins to trace a hesitant course downward, gradually joining with other drops of water to become a steady stream. The stream gains speed and strength thousands of feet below and hundreds of miles later, what were once single drops have converged to become the mightiest river on earth, the Amazon, flowing into the Atlantic Ocean at a rate of more than 7 million cubic feet per second. The Amazon is more powerful than the next 10 largest rivers in the world combined. As I stand before you, a missionary ready to head over to the Philippines, let me suggest to you that I am nothing more than a water drop. As you are a Christian sitting in a pew this morning in Chickasha, Oklahoma, you are nothing more than a water drop. But as water drops in this section begin to form together, you create a puddle that eventually starts to join with this one, with this one, with this one. And pretty soon, the Bible Baptist Church of Chickasha, Oklahoma is a little bigger puddle, maybe a pond, and as you join with water drops like myself and other missionaries that you support going around the world, we can be the mightiest river for the gospel. To take the gospel wherever God calls us to take it. But you see, as I sit and I look at, at churches, including my own church that we're sent out of, I understand that not all the water drops are involved. I understand not all the water drops have joined in the river. This church, any church, will never be what God calls you to be. We as a Christian family will never be what God wants us to be in spreading the gospel around the world until every water drop is invested and fully involved in the mission of God.